Hello students, welcome back to our lecture. So today we are going to discuss a continuous lecture related to the constitution and Indian polity. So in the previous lecture we have discussed what exactly is the constitution all about and thereafter what is the exact meaning of the articles and what is the schedules and what is the significance of the amendment. I told you very clearly that in a year we can make any number of amendments and at the same time for a single time you can able to make only one change at a time you can also make 10 to 50 changes at a time for every change we will be having one number you know so that is why I told you in the previous lecture we have read about that first constitutional amendment act first constitutional amendment act every constitutional amendment act follows with a particular year so in which year which constitutional amendment act came into existence and at the same time this constitutional amendment act is related to what so these are the things the aspirants need to keep in mind okay see and with respect to amendment of the constitution there is no need for us to go through each and every amendment in a single go so whenever we are going to discuss a particular topic and the associated with that topic whatever the amendments are there whatever the changes are there we will be discussing about that and I also told you the significance of the amendment see for suppose if one time the present prime minister if he wants to make any changes if he don't want to change the constitution but he wanted to implement those things in an ad hoc manner rather than putting that in the constitution he just wanted to implement that but the thing is that we are not sure that whether the next coming prime minister will he follow the same guidelines or not but if the same prime minister makes changes in the constitution the next coming prime ministers should also definitely have to obey the rules and regulations that were added in the Indian constitution for suppose you can take 61st constitutional amendment act can anyone tell me what is the 61st constitutional amendment act even though I may not hear your voice but just utter these things in your mind if you know this answer 61st constitutional amendment act so this is the amendment act which has lowered the right to voting from 21 years to 18 years from 21 years to 18 years so in the year 1988 through 61st constitutional amendment act the right to vote that is universal adult franchise the right to vote was decreased from 21 to 18 years for suppose if now if the government want to make some changes if they want to either to increase the age of voting or if they want to decrease the age of voting they again have to make the changes to the constitution first of all so far we have made 105 constitutional amendment acts if we want to make any change that is going to be 106th constitutional amendment act so in which year we will be going to experience this means obviously in the year 2022 maybe the age group is going to get decreased from 18 to 16 years this is just an imagination so if things happens what it would be going to happening because 61st this is in the year 1988 so now it is 2022 the numbers have increased so that is why I will be calling that as a 106th constitutional amendment act students will be facing lot of confusion over here so why the years are there do we need to remember the years do we need to remember the amendments so is it compulsory then definitely I will say that it is compulsory but if you go through all the amendments at one go definitely it going to be very difficult for you but whenever we discuss a particular topic there will come across all the things then you will have a particular clarity perfect clarity then you can also have these things in mind for a long period of time with respect to the concepts or with respect to the you know a particular aspect rather than going through all the amendments at one particular time okay then after this so the first point we discussed is nothing but constitution which contains a set of rules and regulations and the next point we discussed is nothing but constitution contains a set of articles and thereafter these articles were arranged in the form of a parts these articles are arranged in the form of a parts then the more elaborate explanation of the articles is nothing but the schedules whatever the changes we are making to the constitution I will be calling that as an amendment I will be just calling that as an amendment so 
amendments made so far is nothing but the 105 constitutional amendment acts see with respect to articles i told you if you count them the answer will be 471 but if you search in the google what is article 471 what is article 450 what is article 420 you will not get the any answer why because the number mentioned beside the articles is nothing but 395 so 395 so any article that got newly added that themselves got added to the existing articles like an attachment rather than adding the articles in a new manner like 396 397 this is a common point where most of the aspirants are failing to understand they are in a belief that the number of articles are around 400 place but nowhere you will get the answer what is article 400 similarly if you go to the parts as i told you at the beginning of the constitution during the beginning of the constitution the number of parts are nothing but 22 the number of parts are 22 if you count them the answer will be 22 and if you uh, see the number beside them the answer will be 22 but later on few new more parts got added to the indian constitution then the number of art parts were increased to 25 but even this in the google if you search what is part 25 of the indian constitution part 24 or part 25 you will not get the answer why because there are only 22 parts in the indian constitution but if you count them the answer will be 25 as i told you in the previous lecture so initially there used to be part 4 which is nothing but dpsps to this part 4 4a got added that is nothing but fundamental duties and i also told you 9a this got added newly and there is also 9b this got added newly 9a is municipalities 9b is panchayats and already there is an existing part 9 again if you go to the part 14 and within the part 14 one more point got added 14a that is through the tribunals so for suppose if you count them one two three the numbers are three but if you the numbers are three but if you count them one two three four five six seven so the numbers are three but the count goes on increasing to seven so that is the point which the students need to keep in mind so then sir you said that there are 22 parts then few four four parts got added the answer has to be 26 then what is the rationality behind 26 and 25 i told you that seventh part in the indian constitution has been repealed that has been repealed so in the seventh part there is no nothing is present in the seventh part it is just lying vacant so when the seventh part has been removed rather than changing the remaining parts likewise for suppose if seventh part they have removed 8 becomes 7 9 becomes 8 10 becomes 9 11 becomes 10 and so on so if you just remove the seventh part and if you go on changing the remaining all the parts it will be very difficult so when after removing the provisions present in the seventh part they just left it empty idle rather than changing the remaining parts they just continued in the same manner but the seventh part itself just lying vacant if we, they want to add any new part they may continue add, adding that to the seventh part or they may add continuously like 23rd part or they may attach to the existing part it all depends on the uh, you know lawmakers so wherever they want interest so we can't say definitely they why can't they add to the seventh part why can't they make it as a 23 or else why are they attaching to the 22 itself there is no rationality behind that but it's a normal thing normal scenario so that is why if you remove the seventh part then the answer going to be 25 so that is why 25 parts are there in the indian constitution and see 4a and if, if you see the amendment 4a fundamental duties this got added in 1976 1976 through 42nd constitutional amendment act through 42nd constitutional amendment act and next if you look at 9a this is all about municipalities 9a municipalities this got added in 1992 through 74th constitutional amendment act and if you look at 9b this is nothing but cooperative societies cooperative societies this got added in the year 2011 through 97th constitutional amendment act through 97th constitutional amendment act 
Similarly, if you look at the 14A, which is nothing but tribunals. So, we will be discussing separately tribunals when we discuss about the Supreme Court. When you know, when you have a complete idea about judiciary, thereafter, I will be explaining you what exactly is this tribunal. So, this also got added in the year 1976 through 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. And among this, you can able to find one commonality that is nothing but 4A got added in the same year, 14A got added in the same year. I told you already, in one year, there can be 10 different types of amendments or else in one amendment, they can make 10 changes or in one amendment, they can make only one change also. That all depends, in, depends on the convenience of the lawmaker. We cannot question that. We just need to go through them. What? Because they being the fact, we just need to have to go through them. So, these are the different parts. And if we go back to the schedules, so how many schedules are there? At the time of constitution, there used to be 8 schedules. The later on, the number of schedules got increased to 12. So, the number of schedules are 12. The number be uh, behind the schedules is also 12. The count is 12, the number is 12. Whereas for the parts and for the articles, that is different. So, this is the thing which the student need to keep in mind. In the morning class itself, uh, in the previous lecture itself, I told you, ninth schedule. Ninth schedule is nothing but the land reforms. Ninth schedule is the land reforms that got added. So, if you go across that, ninth schedule. So, ninth schedule is nothing but the land reforms. So, when did this ninth schedule got added? That is in the year 1951 through first constitutional amendment act. Through first constitutional amendment act. 10th schedule is nothing but anti-defection law. Anti-defection law, this got added in the year 1985 through 52nd Constitutional Amendment Act. So, I have clearly explained you and I have also told you the significance behind the amendment. So, by taking the example in the 2014 where the uh, then opposition party member Venkai Naidu when he demanded the special category status, the Prime Minister have accepted to give the special category status. But after 2014, the same person who have demanded the special category status, they were in a position not to give the special category status. They themselves have demanded the special category status, but they are not in a position to give the special category status. The reason is, in the 2014 State Reorganization Act, there is no particular or specific mention about state reorganization in that particularly about special category status. If it would have written in the 2014 state reorganization act, you would have went to the Supreme Court or High Court stating that this is mentioned or in the state reorganization act, but they are not giving. I told you clearly in the parliament, there will be certain extent to which the courts can enter into the uh, you know proceedings of the parliament. Similarly, parliament can also you know, speak or involve into the proceedings of the Supreme Court, but only to some extent. Why that limit is there? We will be going to study in this further lecture. Okay. So, this is all about amendment. You have, hope you have a, you got a very good picture about the schedules. And see, in the 8th schedule also, few more changes got added. I would like to stress that. So, basically, 8th schedule is all about official languages. 8th schedule is all about official languages. So, official languages. Since the beginning of the constitution, how many official languages are there? So, there are 14 official languages since the beginning of the constitution. But later on, the strength went on increasing. So, at present, how many official languages are there? The answer will be 22. There are 22 official languages are there. And guys, I am giving you the assignment. Just try to find it out how many official languages are there. In the examination, the question can be given. So, which among the following are the official languages of the country? Which among the following languages are not present as a part of official languages? As I told you, there is a big lacuna with respect to the online lectures. That is, the student will be in a very, very relaxed position. If you continuously listen to the lectures in a relaxed manner, definitely that will increase the comfort zone. You will not be to focus for completely in the online lectures. That is why I am always stressing you to write running notes and also keep a focus on the assignments which I am giving you. We will be discussing all the facts but at the same time I want you to spend certain time on the assignments which I am giving you because polity 
in the in the session i told you that it is a mixture of both static and also dynamic so dynamic is completely related to the current affairs in the static part also we will be discussing about the facts but there will be some hardcore facts like who is the longest serving speaker who is the first speaker or else who is the women speaker so some kind of facts will be there we will be discuss as many things as possible and apart from that i'll also give you the assignment so that is all for this languages so initially there were 14 official languages but what happened in the year 1967 in the year 1967 through 21st constitutional amendment act through 21st constitutional amendment act one official language got added in addition to the 14 official languages what is that that is nothing but sindhi so sindhi became the 15th official language so to be the in the within the part of india sindhi 15th official language then after in the year 1992 through 71st constitutional amendment act through 71st constitutional amendment act few more languages got added that is nothing but konkani manipuri konkani manipuri and also nepali konkani manipuri and also nepali these languages got added so 1992 through 71st amendment act konkani manipuri nepali got added so that is 16th 17th and 18th official languages then after in the year 2003 in the year 2003 through 92nd constitutional amendment act 92nd constitutional amendment act four more languages got added into the indian constitution that four more languages are nothing but bodo dogri maithili santhali bodo dogri maithili santhali so these are the four languages late which added later on so 1920 21 22 so these are the 22 official languages which got added later on again there is one more amendment which was in use that is in the year 2011 in the year 2011 through 96th constitutional amendment act one more change got happened to the official languages that is previously they used to call a language as oriya oriya this language oriya was changed into the odia oriya was renamed as odia through 96th constitutional amendment act see guys how many amendments did we discussed so far okay so just if we go on discussing here like so uh, with respect to parts 1 2 3 4 4 four amendments did we discussed about the newly gotted thing and there after four amendments we have discussed five six six amendments so then after in the eighth schedule 7 8 9 10 10 amendments we have discussed so far so this is the eighth schedule and the ninth schedule we discussed that is nothing but land reforms and also other provisions that is not only about land reforms but it does contain some other provisions related to uh, ninth schedule other than land reforms 10th schedule and we have also discussed 11th schedule 11th schedule is nothing but the panchayats 11th schedule will deal or discuss about the panchayats so 11th schedule is all about panchayats and thereafter 12th schedule is about the municipalities panchayats and this is the municipalities so panchayats were discussed as a part of 73rd municipalities are discussed as a part of 74th so this is a brief introduction or else this is a brief explanation about the foundational concepts that is required for understanding this subject polity and the next thing which we will be discussing is nothing but india is having one salient feature that is not nothing but india is a federal state india is a federal state so the opposite concept of the federal state is nothing but unitary state is nothing but unitary state federal state and also unitary state so what is the meaning of this federal state and what is the meaning of unitary state we need to understand so federal state means wherever 
there is a division of powers wherever there is a division of powers we do call that as a federal state wherever there is no division of powers only single government will exercise entire authority we will call that as a unitary state unitary state and the federal state unitary state means all the powers are located in one single government federal state all the powers are divided in a two governments okay i'll tell you the example for unitary state so united kingdom it is an example for a unitary state even north korea is an example for a unitary state if you take the federal system india is an example for that united states of america is an example for that canada australia so are examples for the federal state so whenever we discuss about the federal state the first thing that comes to in comes into our brain is nothing but division of powers division of powers whenever we speak or whenever we discuss about federal the first thing that comes into our brain is nothing but the division of powers so what is the division of powers in india there is a central government and there is a state government the word federal itself means that there are going to be two governments okay let's uh, come back to that one. there are going to be the two governments so in order to make you understand this federal features in a, with a perfect example let me just tell you with an example that is just take example of a father this father is uh, we will be taking two cases the first case where the father is having a single son the first case where the father is having a single son father is having a single son and the second case where the father is having two sons or two daughters two sons or two daughters second case where the father is having two sons or two daughters and in the first case first case where the father is having a single son so as the father is having a single son there is no need you you just tell me is there any need to divide the property among the son is there any need to divide the property among the sons definitely damn sure that there is no need for the father to divide the property excuse me so there is no need for the father to divide the property you understood this right because being a single son all the property or being a single doctor all the property will goes into uh, her name or his name but when the same father is having two sons or two daughters or whatever the case may be so just uh, limit yourself to two sons or two daughters so then what will be the scenario i'll just tell you so the father is having 50 acres of land 50 acres of land so if the father uh, you know do not distribute that in a proper manner yes definitely 50 acres will get or going to get distributed among the sons but how for suppose the father is having 25 acres on the main road if the father is having 25 acres on the main road and if the father is having 25 acres on the vicinity or else at the you know completely uh, end of the village or last outskirts of the village if this is a scenario can he divide this 25 acres directly to one son and this 25 acres directly to other son definitely no why because that is costly and this is less costly so in order to overcome the conflicts the father should divide the assets in a perfect manner which asset will get to the first person which asset will get to the second person then there won't be any problem with respect to assets distribution got it or not my point in the same manner as the father is having two sons then there has to be perfect sharing of the property or powers similarly with respect to power also if there are two governments who are enjoying the powers definitely there have to be a proper perfect division of powers if there is no perfect division of powers this government will say the entire powers should be in my hand this government will say the entire powers should be in my hand when these two governments go on saying that the entire powers should be in my hand then that leads to a big quarreling or big rift 
in order to overcome this one there has to be a clear cut division of powers that clear cut division of powers in the indian constitution is present in the seventh schedule of the indian constitution is present in what in the seventh schedule of the indian constitution in the seventh schedule exactly the division of powers are there okay this is what the federal government mean then what about the unitary government single son so there is no need for you to mention about division of powers why there is no need to mention about division of powers why because there is only one government so that is the meaning of a federal structure so in the federal state federal means definitely there going to be a division of powers so in india as i told you in the seventh schedule there is a clear cut division of powers so seventh schedule consists of three lists that is nothing but union list in some books you will also find it as a central list you will also call it as a central list so there is a union list and a second one there is a state list union list and the second one that is nothing but the state list and the third one that is nothing but the concurrent list third one it's a concurrent list third one it's a concurrent list so union list state list and also concurrent list so likewise the three lists were present so how many you, you know how many subjects were there in the union list the question can be asked so if you count them if you count the subjects under union you will get the answer 19 but the number mentioned beside them is nothing but 97 so if you count them they are 98 in number but the number mentioned beside them is 97 and thereafter in the state list so in the state list if you count them the numbers are 59 but the number mentioned beside them is 66 i'll tell you why it is 59 and why it is 66 and in the concurrent list the total number of subjects are 52 means the total count is 52 and if you Uh, the number mentioned beside them is nothing but the 47 so this is the number mentioned beside them the number mentioned beside them and this is the count and this is the count number mentioned beside them and this is the count so this is the thing and see i'll tell you how union uh, unitary government will minister and how a federal government will administer or rule the country for suppose i'll just tell you take the example of a unitary state this is a big state this is the boundary of a state i am just demarcating the boundaries i am just demarcating the boundaries so this is how i am going to demarcate the boundaries so for this entire territory there will be one ruler so maybe just imagine yourself as a king as a prime minister or else as a president one ruler so this ruler in order to administer this country he is dividing the entire territory of the country into small areas he is dividing the entire area of the country into what small areas he is dividing them into the small areas so what this person is going to do he will be appointing see i am just telling you this ruler himself will appoint a person this ruler himself will appoint a person in each area this ruler himself will be appointing a person in each area when the ruler is appointing a person in each area this appointed person will be ruling the country according to the interests of the ruler according to the interests of the ruler isn't it or not so for this entire country there is a single ruler and the entire country is divided into number of parts and this ruler in order to rule in a more efficient manner in order to rule in a very simple manner he will be appointing a person to each place and this person will be administering or this person will be working under the ruler so this is a unitary state everything will be on the interest of the ruler everything will be on the interest of the ruler so this is an example for the unitary state so this is an example for the unitary state similarly there is a federal state how come the structure or how comes the concept in a 
federal state will be there. So just imagine this is also an area. So entire country. So for this entire country at the level of center, at the level of center, there will be central government formed on the will of the people, based on the will of the people. And in the state, in each state, in each state, there will be state government. Same the state government will also be formed based on the will of the people. Then Inka Miku election sela jarutai. Like PMLA Ostadu, CMLA Ostadi Anta could discuss Chale. This is just an overview. Ela onto the end. So federal structure and center Mutaniki, India Mutaniki central level low Oka government to the Prati state Oka state government to the I think this state will not be under this center. E state, e center this state is center in the Panichayad. State law on day government in Kuda people elect to chase Kuntaru. Center law on day government in Kuda people elect chase Kuntaru. People themselves will elect the central government. People themselves will elect the state government. Whereas in the first case, people are not electing the rulers in the each area. The ruler, the king himself, is going to appoint a person whom he knows. And this appointed person will be working under this ruler. But here, state government is autonomous, central government is autonomous. Exactly the scenario which you see in India. That is why it is a federal state and this is a unitary state. When it comes to federal state, every time there will be a division of powers. So, what happened? Initially, the uh, number is 100 and the number is 97, the count is 100. But after GST, two things got eliminated. So as they got eliminated, number became 98 and 97. See, like 17, 1, 17, 2, 17, 3, this kind of things will be there. Like 92A, 92B, 92C, 92, likewise it will be there. So, number is 97. We are having only one extra point. That extra point is related to 92. So that is why the number is 98, 97, the count is 98, okay, thereafter. Initially, with respect to state, the count is 66, number is also 66. The count is 66 and the number is also 66. But what happened is, in the year 1976, through 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, through 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, what happened? Five provisions from the state list, five provisions from the state list got transferred to the concurrent list. Initially, concurrent list used to be number 47 and the count is also 47. So, count is 47, number is 47. State list also 66, count number is also 66. But what happened? Five points from this got transferred into the concurrent list. So, minus 5, that means 61 and the number is 66 after getting added the number count became 52 and the number is remained same as 47 so what happened over here even though few provisions got removed from the state list but the number has not yet changed and they have just kept the number as the same as i told you previously and a okay number changes in tarvata ipadu 79 number this is 18 is 17 jadam, 19 is 18 jadam, 20 is 19 jadam, 21 is 20 jadam. Ila chayilu, thesis in dhani ala ne unchi, migitha trend anta kuda ala ne continue jesar. Andike 5 thesis are ga bati 61, 66. And thesis in tharavata, dini 48, 49, 50 and attach jesh. Kani, ikkade in jesar ante, existing articles eva ite untayu. A existing articles ne, Kotha points ni kotha parts ante kotha ka yeh the tis ko chat jaise saro viti dekhar peta. Andi kosam num count to fifty two ay poindi number matra forty seven. So idhi jodani each side count to each side number anche pi first ni chirasen. So idhi trend continue othon. Okay na? So that is fifty two forty seven. Ante yendu ko sir why is this list? Ante as I told you. So here there will be a center and there will be a state. Center want to control. Our center wanted to keep all the powers in its hand. 
at the same time state want to keep all the powers in the hands of the state so when center is saying this is mine when the state is saying this is mine that le definitely leads to the conflict in order to overcome the conflict what they have done they have separated the lists so union list that will be dealt by the center state list that will be dealt by the states concurrent list that will be dealt by both for suppose if i tell you union list defense is an example for the union list banking is an example for the union list or else insurance is an example for the union list Con, uh, you know atomic energy is an example for the union list interstate trade is an example for the union list so what about state state gov uh, means uh, local government is under the state list sanitation is under the state list public health is under the state list public order is under the state list law and order is under the state list likewise there are many aspects which are there in the state list so state list lo koni kachithanga undi so avanni state chusukuntaru so what about the concurrent list there are aspects which gets divided between this two ante center will take care of that and at the same time state will also take care of that so that one you will call it as a concurrent list and they and see in the future we will be or we will be going to discuss about the uh, center state relations when we go on discussing about the center state relations there you will understand clearly what exactly uh, you know state list is what is the concurrent list what are the extra provisions which we need to keep on mind everything okay to this extent just to keep in your mind india is a federal state where the powers will be divided between the center and the state okay next the next point which we are going to discuss the next point which we are going to discuss is nothing but you know who will be making the laws in the country mani india lo shasanalu ante india lo chattalu who will make laws in india i am asking the question to you cheppandi ok sari meere india lo laws evaru chestaru who will be making the laws in india so the most of the people the answer comes from your brain so the answer will be prime minister the answer will be chief minister the answer might be president but very less people will say the parliament is the answer so who will make laws in india the parliament will make laws in india why the parliament will be making the laws in india in order to understand that in order to make you understand that i'll tell you with a few example small example where you will understand that very clear so for suppose see let's just take the example of x y and z x y and z take the example of x y z x y z combinedly x y z combinedly have kept a company partnership firm so now tell me so there is a company there is a company don't bother about name of the company this is just an imagination company company belongs to xyz so now tell me the decisions of the company will be taken by company belongs to xyz the decisions of the company will be taken by who so what is the answer the decisions of the company will be taken by x y and z itself so company belongs to xyz and the decisions will be taken by the xyz itself fine got it my point so for suppose see now my question is if x wants to take the money from for suppose whatever the money x y z are going to get will that money get deposited in the account of x or will that deposited in the y or will that get deposited in the account of z in whose account the money is going to get deposited uh, tell me x or y or z so the answer will be the money is neither going to get deposited in x or y or z the money is going to get deposited in a joint account the money is going to get deposited in a joint account the money is going to get deposited in a joint account so joint account lo money vastha for suppose if x want to take the money from this joint account can he take the money directly from the joint account is it easy can he take the money from the joint account no he cannot take the money from joint account 
So for that, x need to take the permission from the y and x need to take the permission from the z. x need to take the permission from the y and x need to take the permission from the z. x, y, z. Similarly, if y want to take the money, y need to take permission from the x and uh, he need to take permission from the z. And the same follows with respect to z. Means, the decisions of the company will be taken by x, y, z. Money the company is going to get deposited into an account called as joint account. And from that account, if we want to take the money, we need to take the permission of these three people. Yes or no? Okay. You got this point well, right? So, with this point, I will just make a relation. So, now tell me, India. My dear students, just tell me, India. India belongs to whom? India. As I said, company belongs to X, Y, Z. India belongs to whom? India Yavariki Chendi Untun. So the answer will be yes, rational thing chendi, just answer about that. India belongs to Indians. As company belongs to XYZ in the above scenario, India belongs to Indians. Company belongs to in, uh, XYZ, India belongs to whom? Indians. Yes, as India belongs to Indians, that is good, fine. Then the decision with respect to India will be taken by whom? The decisions with respect to company will be taken by XYZ. Similarly, the decisions with respect to India will be taken by the Indians. Company decisions XYZ because company belongs to XYZ. India belongs to Indians. So, the decisions with respect to India should obviously be taken by the Indians. Should obviously be taken by the Indians. And now here the question is, so for suppose, if we want to make, you know, uh, we if we want to repeal Article 370, if we want to repeal Article 370, or if we want to add uh, two more states to the 28 states, if we want to make any loss to the form, if we want to make any form loss, so who will be taking? This is related to India. Then only who should take? Indians. But Indians... How many Indians are there? So, the Indians are around, excuse me. So, as India belongs to Indians. So, India the decisions of India should definitely be taken by the Indians. But the Indians are around 130 crore people. So it's very difficult. If Narendra Modi want to go to America, so he cannot ask the permission of all 130 crore people, right? So I want to go to United States of America. I want to meet Joe Biden. I want to enter into certain relation or pact with Joe Biden. How many of you are saying yes? And how many of you are saying no? So please send SMS to 5757 or 56 something like that. So then the Prime Minister will be keep on waiting. So just send me the details. How many people are going to participate in the survey? So let me just go through the survey and he will be waiting for that. It will take a huge amount of time. Then the entire decisions will be in a standstill. They, it will take a lot of time. So in order to overcome that, what we will be doing is that Indians, on behalf of the Indians, will be electing their representatives. Indians. On behalf of Indians, they will be electing their representatives. So, Indians say yes, Indians will be electing their representatives. So, those representatives will be calling them as a MPs. Indians will be electing whom? Their representatives. So, the representatives of the Indians are nothing but MPs. They will be sitting where? In the parliament. They will be sitting in the parliament. So, Indians electing, and Pratipadi Lakshalamandi, every 10 lakh people, on behalf of them, they will be electing a single person. If this single person is saying yes, then this 10 lakh people are going to say yes. Means, the single person is representing this 10 lakh people. Similarly, the members who are present in the parliament, they are going to represent, the members who are present in the parliament, they are going to represent the entire Indian strata. That is the reason why, Every time the decisions with respect to India 
should be taken by the parliament. That means indirectly who will be taking? MPs. MPs are representing who? Indians. That means the decisions with respect to India is taken by the Indians itself. That is why India is always called as the indirect democracy. Why means? People are not taking the decision directly, but on behalf of the people, people's representatives will be taking the decisions. That is why it is called as the, uh, you know, indirect democracy. We'll get this point democracy in once are uh, going in coming lecture. And then after that, see, as I told you, the company, whatever the amount the company XYZ uh, partners are XYZ, whatever the amount they are getting, going, going to get deposited in a single account, which is called as a joint account. Similarly, now, so India, India belongs to whom? Indians. So whatever the amount the India is going to get, whatever the amount the India is going to get, that will get deposited in a single account which is called as a consolidated fund of India. Consolidated means combination of all. So joint means combination of three. As it is being a larger one, the consolidated one, the combination of all this thing is present which is called as a consolidated fund of India. So from this consolidated fund of India means India is going to get amount in the form of a taxes, GST, direct taxes, indirect taxes and India is going to get amount in a various ways. So the amount gets deposited in the consolidated fund of India. Now tell me, can the Prime Minister directly withdraw the money from consolidated fund of India? He cannot. Can the President directly withdraw the money from consolidated fund of India? He cannot. But how can we withdraw the money from consolidated fund of India? We need permission of the Indians. Because the amount is belonging to the Indians, the permission of the Indians is must. But on behalf of the Indians, Indians representatives, on behalf of the Indians, Indians representatives will be present. Where these representatives will be present? That is, these representatives will be present in the parliament. That is why in order to withdraw the money, that is why in order to gather in order to get the money from consolidated fund of India, we definitely require permission of the parliament. So, the decisions with respect to India will be taken by the parliament. The money that India is going to get will be deposited in a combined account called as consolidated fund of India and from that money, we will be taking permission of the parliament. The same example I will use when I explain about the budget. That is why whenever we mention about the budget, so the budget can be introduced in the parliament, particularly in the Lok Sabha. Why? Because Lok Sabha contains the people, representatives who are directly elected by the people, who are directly elected by the people. So that is why, so entire consolidated fund of India, the money will be taken only with the, uh, you know, permission of the parliament. So this is what the parliament. So we have discussed what exactly is the federal features, what exactly the is the unitary features. So in the unitary there will be one ruler, he will be appointing the persons who will be taking care of the smaller areas. Similarly, over here in federal state there will be a center and there will be a state. Both are autonomous to each other. So both of them will be electing their representatives and they are completely answerable to the people. So and thereafter I told you what exactly is the parliament. So as India belonging to Indians, the decisions should be taken by the Indians. But it is very difficult for the Indians to make the decision. But so Indians have elected their representatives. So for India, if we want to take any decisions, our representatives should take the decision. These representatives are present in where? Parliament. That is why the decision maker in India is every time parliament. You should never say it as a prime minister. You should never say it as a president. You should never say it as a chief minister or governor or anything. The decisions with respect to India is taken by the parliament. The decision with respect to state will be taken by the state legislature. So this is the thing. So once we came to know, once we understood clearly about the federal feature, means whatever thing that is present in the center will also be present in the state. So if there is a central government at the center, so there will be state government in the state. So for suppose, at the level of center, who will be making the laws? Parliament will be making the laws at the level of center. At the level of state, 
who will be making the laws state legislature will be going to make the laws state legislature state legislature will be going to make the laws so once if we complete the parliament automatically we will be completing what state legislature and in the parliament there is something called as lok sabha and there is another thing rajya sabha and this is also similar to state legislature in the state legislature we will be calling something called as assembly and there is also a council there is an assembly and there is also a council see the work things the proceedings in the lok sabha is almost similar in the assembly also whatever the proceedings we follow in the rajya sabha the same kind of proceedings will be existing in the council so wherever the two houses are present lok sabha and rajya sabha wherever two houses are present will be just calling that as a bicameral legislature wherever there are two houses will call that as a bicameral for the first time in india bicameral legislature came into existence through 1919 government of india act 1919 government of india act is the first instance where the bicameralism mode of government came into existence okay that is the same year where the diarchy also got introduced we'll be studying about that in the further lecture okay at the level of center there will be a prime minister at the level of state there will be a chief minister here there is going to be a president of india here there will be going to be a governor of the state okay here there will be a central council of ministers and here there will be a state council of ministers so if in the center there is a supreme court and in the state there will be a high court not exactly similar but they are almost a kind of similar relation we can able to see so that is the reason i told you federal wherever you see the federal concept there will be a sharing of powers division of powers so in which schedule this division of powers is present in the seventh schedule which consists of central list concurrent list and also the state list so why there has to be a division of powers whenever there are two organs definitely there leads to a conflict among these two organs in order to overcome this conflict there has to be a clear cut division of the powers that is present in the seventh schedule as india being a federal state so the structure that is present at the center will also be same at the set state so that is why once if we complete the center we will also complete the state and i also told you why india is called as a indirect form of democracy why is it not a direct democracy why the amount will get deposited in the consolidated fund of india when i discussed about the budget consolidated fund of india contingency fund of india under article 266 we will be going to discuss about that so that's it guys today we discussed very clearly some other important aspects about the foundational classes related to the polity and there are still few more concepts in order to understand about the foundational concepts of the polity we'll be going that in the further lecture and to this extent i'm going to end this lecture and also i'm just saying you after the completion of the class spend at least 15 minutes on the notes which you have written and i also promised you that i'm going to give you the give you the notes which was written by some of my students which is a offline pdf i'll provide you that and if you have any doubts put the you know put comments in the comment section i'll be interacting with you that's it for this lecture thank you guys